life doesn't come from the wrong answers. It comes from the wrong question or failing to ask a question at all. You're watching Young and Profiting Podcast on YouTube. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Hala Taha, and on Young and Profiting Podcast, we investigate a new topic each week and interview some of the brightest minds in the world. Before we get started, hit the subscribe button and don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified every time we drop a new video. Hi, Matt. Welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I am so excited to have you on the show. I am a Shark Tank fanatic. It is literally the only TV show that I watch uh, for the past like five years. And uh, I first found about you, found out about you on that show. And you are an exceptional businessman. You know, you're the founder of RSC Ventures. You were, uh, you know, working for the Jets, the Dolphins. You've done so many cool things. You're a partner in VaynerMedia, which people don't even really know about. And I can't wait to dig into all of that. But first, I want to start with your childhood, because I know that it has a lot to do with who you are and how it's shaped you. And uh, a pivotal point in your life is when you dropped out of high school. So I thought we could start there. And I want to understand, you know, why you decided to drop out of high school, how you came to that decision. And really, for to start, leading up to that like what was it like for you leading up to that I know you had an ailing mother she was sick and I would love to understand that dynamic so we're just gonna go deep right we're just gonna go we're just gonna start right at the deep parts all right sounds good so uh and for those of you who heard this story I apologize but um uh so my but my background does have everything to do with who I am today as it is for most of us for better or worse um I grew up in Queens New York Shout out to Queens. Uh, and uh, with a product of a single mom uh, with four miserable boys growing up in a tiny little shoebox apartment on Springfield Boulevard in Queens. And um, yeah, my mother had been through a ton of stuff that I only really found out about uh, later on after she had passed away that kind of contextualized everything I went through as a child. But my childhood was framed with you know, extreme poverty, extreme shame. Uh, extreme concealment, because as a kid, you know, you, you the last thing you want people to know, at least back then, uh, is how poor you are. So um, my early days were through of endless side hustles. Uh, I used to sell flowers on street corners. I was that kid knocking on your window. So be nice if somebody's trying to sell you flowers. You know, <laughs> um, I would sell handbags at flea markets, ten dollar leather handbags, uh, uh, and then. Uh, and I worked at McDonald's, scraping gum from the bottom of um, of tables. So, so that was the context. My mother was amazing; worked really hard, and she had um, she had a, a no high school diploma. Growing up, and she, you know, she got divorced when I was around nine, and it always was sort of a hole in her life uh, that she knew she was smart and gifted, but had gone through this terrible childhood and actually didn't even have a high school degree. And so, I watched her go from. Uh, you know, basically on her hands and knees cleaning apartments for elderly homebound senior citizens to getting her GED at the local community college and then enrolling in Queens College and really fight for years upon years to get first a bachelor's degree and then eventually pursue two different master's degrees uh, in urban studies and library science. So my prism of my childhood was poverty, dysfunction, but also aspiration and watching my mother go through this journey. And around, you know, 13, I would be have all these mixed emotions, which anybody out there who's suffering alone can relate to. Like, is anyone going to help? And does anybody care? And, you know, there were so many different letdowns as a kid. No intervention. I'm like, doesn't everybody see how difficult the situation is? And plus, as a kid, you just don't want to be in charge. And the whole parental dynamic was turned on its head when I was growing up. So I was sort of the parent. Uh, and as the parent, eventually I made a decision that, like, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And the key is I need to make enough money to eventually get out of here as fast as humanly possible. Right. Because you have a selfish streak as a kid. Nobody wants to be in charge. And so watching my mother do that, get her GD as an adult gave me an epiphany that um, there was a loophole back then that if you could get your GD and do well enough, you could technically go to any college. So they said, right? Nobody really does this. <laughs> but, I, but I thought, well, why don't I just do this on purpose and re-engineer and make, architect my entire life? And that's what I decided when I was 14. And, and in order to make sure I would stick with this crazy plan, that I um, made sure I got left back over and over again. So I sat in the same homeroom with kids with beepers who were pursuing a very different path, you know, dealing drugs, whatever, just sat in the back of that room. And I decided I was going to drop out. Um, and it was the most important decision I ever made because I had the whole weight of the world telling me, one, you're going to be branded a loser. 
Two, you're never going to be able to get a good job, et cetera, et cetera. And what I learned from that experience is like maybe true from me. This educational path may work from where you sit. But as a kid trying to take care of his parents, his mom, um, this doesn't work for me. And I need to get to college as soon as possible so I can get a well-paying job. Uh, and that's what I did. And I, it was actually the best, most important decision I ever made in my life. Everything I built um, from that point forward was on top of that one decision. It's it's so amazing that you had that kind of knowledge at such a young age and you were able to make such a big decision and stick with it, even when people told you that it would be the worst mistake of your life. I know you were a good student and a lot of the, your teachers kind of weren't approving of what you were doing. But in terms of your, your parent-child dynamic with your mom, how you had to act like the parent, how do you think that that impacted you later on? Do you feel like that gave you like a, a chip on your shoulder? Do you feel like that made you like super responsible f for the rest of your life? Like how did that positively impact you? Because at the time it really probably sucked, but <laughs> now do you feel like that has positively impacted you in any way? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I think, it, well, number one, it made me very empathetic. Uh, like to watch a person literally deteriorate throughout your entire formative years, you know, to jump to the end of the story, I drop out of high school, I go to college, I go to college for seven years at night. I work and work and work to build myself up. I went from McDonald's earning three seventy five an hour to the time I was 26 years old, 10 years later to being press secretary to the mayor of New York making six figures. That's a lot of ground to cover, but also she deteriorated throughout that entire path. So while I was doing that, living this secret life, I would spend my nights at the ER. You know, we literally had no money and I refused to go on any kind of public service. We would go to the church all the time for food. So um, what I learned from that, this, the day I become press secretary, the mayor of New York, this heady moment when I finally achieved everything, she dies that morning. So I guess the reality, what I learned from it is that the greatest thing you could do with your time, energy and money and power is to ameliorate somebody else's suffering. It doesn't mean that you have to like devote your life to being a saint. But just from a practical standpoint, if somebody had intervened in that in that journey in those 10 years, she would she would not have died. I mean, like we just were wasting away. Um, and so that stays with me Two, there's no cavalry coming. It just is what it, is. it sounds harsh, but you have to take matters into your own hands. You have to be an agent in your own rescue. And three, like I, if I'm being totally honest, you know, the parent child dynamic is supposed to be one of sacrifice. You know, mm -hmm. you're a parent, like at the end of the day, it's a one way street, right? Like if you're doing this because you want your child to fulfill you, take care of you, realize all your unrealized aspirations, you got it wrong. And yeah. so I honestly learned a lot from the dysfunction of that dynamic and to resist it because you want to make sure you don't pass on these patterns to the next generation. Right. And so um, but also at the same time, normally when things are distorted in a parent child relationship, it's because of some trauma that has been unrealized or un, 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 unmitigated or unsynthesized. You know, and so I think that was the case with with my with my mother. Like you tend to pass on dysfunction from one generation to another. So I guess my real answer is to really be aware of the patterns that govern us so we don't pass that on to the next generation. Uh, and yeah. that's what I've worked hard on, although I'm probably screwing up my kids in untold other ways by probably overcompensating. <laughs> I'm probably now a helicopter parent, you know, who's like, go free, you know, don't worry. I'm like, but anyway, it is what it is. We're all flawed. But I, th I think that's my greatest lesson I took away from it. I love that. So let's let's back up a little bit. So yeah. you had all these crazy jobs. You were scraping gum uh, like underneath seats at McDonald's. You were selling flowers on the street. And then you got your first real job. It was being a reporter uh, at the Queen's Tribune or an investigative reporter. Right. So mm -hmm. talk to us about how you ended up getting that first real job. Yeah, that's a great why you did your research, too. So I haven't talked about this in a long time. I think it goes back to the every one of us has some kind of gift, some kind of advantage that we could press. But we spend so much energy worrying about what we're not as opposed to focusing on what we are. So what was I this in this little unformed shell of a being at age 16? I could really write. I was gifted with language and with writing. So how do I translate that? So my actually my path out of, out of poverty is one of education, but one of communication and pressing that. So first job, even before that was working for a congressman and doing letters and like and whatnot. And he, he said, you know, you really are gifted. There was an opportunity in a newspaper that he owned an interest in in Queens called the Queens Tribune. They were starting this, you know, uh, column where people would send their problems in. And, and I was meant to do muckraking problem solving. And 
But I took that little column and turned it into something a lot bigger, did big investigative pieces, would often team up with big New York City reporters, and you know some of them resulted in, uh, in awards. So I learned how to press whatever advantage was in front of me to turn that into something much bigger. And I, and I say this to millennials all the time, like make yourself indispensable at mm -hmm. whatever it is you're doing right now, because that is the path to do what you ultimately want to do. So even if you're not happy or you think a job is pointless, press the bet, press the advantage. And that's what I did with um, writing. My ultimate aspiration wasn't really necessarily to be a reporter, but it was a bridge to where I was going. Yeah. What I love about you is that because you dropped out of high school so early, you ended up getting so many experiences, so much more hours of work than a normal teenager would have had. And then that puts you ahead of the game. So by the time you were 26, you were press secretary, which is probably what like a 36 year old would have accomplished, not a 26 year old. By the way, it's a brilliant point that you just raised. Like I, I, you know, Warren Buffett says the most important thing in the world is compounding when it comes to wealth. Like, and I sort of expand the, con com the concept of compounding interest to apply to compounding experiences, which is the same thought applies. If you could pull forward experience, you have more time for that experience to create exponential growth, right? And that's truly the story of my life. Because people say, well, how'd you do? You've overseen two NFL teams by, you know, 40 something around Shark Tank at 43, teach at Harvard Business School. It really goes back to the fact that I was put in a bad situation or like a lot of people, but because I pulled forward my my uh, my evolution, I was able to everything compounded from that moment forward. So I say to folks, like, be patient, but be urgent, because if you can pull forward experiences, they would they will compound. But that's a great, great point. I'm really passionate about it. If ever there was a formula to what I have pulled off, it's that particular phenomenon. Yeah, I think that's amazing. So I know that to get your job as press secretary, you actually quit quite a few times. <laughs> yeah. You quit. And uh, I know you just mentioned this thought about being indispensable. And I, I wanted to add to that, that it's be indispensable. And if they don't appreciate it, quit <laughs> because you can get some leverage that way. So talk to us about the importance of quit quitting, why you quit and how you kind of climb the ladder that way. I love this topic, too. You're hitting on all the topics I love. So anybody listening out there, point number one, um, opportunity is a leading indicator of success and recognition is a lag lagging indicator. So what I mean by that is if you are a successful person and good at something, you will be given opportunity by a person with authority, but the opportunity won't come with the recognition that you secretly crave, money, title. First, grab the opportunity, and then there's a lag be between the time you get the opportunity and the time recognition comes. I'm just trying to reduce this to a formula because I know there's a lot of people out there, am I being taken advantage of? My career is, mm -hmm. you know, shouldn't I get a promotion? There's always a delay. That's life. You will have to make the first deposit. But then you have to assess, okay, after a certain period of time, where's the line between natural lag versus exploitation? And so if you are working for somebody who's a taker or a withholder or a gaslighter, you know, whatever the category is, that's when you have to have the courage to quit because there's another overarching phenomenon operating on humans, especially in positions of authority, which, which come from a place of insecurity, is that familiarity breeds contempt, which really mm. sucks. Because it's like, wait, why are you looking outside this organization for shiny objects, but I'm right here? You know, so, but, the, but you have to be on the lookout for an organization that looks for shiny objects and is contemptuous of its own talent, happens more often than not, and that's when you have to quit. So when I was young, this is a little absurd, but you know, I felt, I, was, I think I was 22, 23, I was ghostwriting pieces for the mayor of New York. I was doing all this like incredible work, but my official job was like handing out newspaper clips at like 5.30 in the morning. I would like cut clips literally from the newspaper and put them on a eight and a half by 11 and walk around in you know, this drudgery of handing them out to people <laughs> while, while doing this heady work of writing things. And eventually I felt like the delta between opportunity and recognition was coming too great. And I was like, well, I want to be press secretary. And I, you know, I, I want to, I want to, you know, that's what I want to do. I want to sit in that chair, not that chair. And then the answer was like, wait your turn, wait your turn. I also had the urgency of trying to elevate quickly to take care of my mom. And then I quit. And then everyone was sort of horrified. And I, yeah, and I, and I went to the most boring job, mind numbing. I could hear the blood rushing through my ears, but it paid more. And then um, four months later, I got a phone call to come back, deputy press secretary, paid for my law school, everything I had wanted. So I always remember that story. Like, you don't want to be, quitting is not disloyal. That's the, there's a different point. You should be loyal and you should give, give to get, but you should also know your own self-worth and just never be afraid to bet on yourself. So I actually did that twice. <laughs> I did it, I did it again. And the second time I did it, you know, it was like, you know, you're not coming back. Like that's, you know, we love you. Like God bless you, whatever. 
a year later, I, I was I became the youngest press secretary in New York City history at 26. So that's amazing. So I guess my big question to you is people quit all the time, but people burn bridges. Right. So how do you quit without actually burning the bridge? So they want they feel OK to kind of put their tail between their legs and ask for you back. That's a great point. Well, I think it begins with in, in de, indispensability. If you're quitting from a place where you were once indispensable, people will remember that. Like, oh, that was the ultimate utility player. I can't believe they got out the door. Two, um, people admire those who know their own self-worth. It's just a fact. We train people how to, te- how to treat us. My wife always says that, which is true. So if you're basically saying, I know my self-worth and I want to go because I want to do something with myself. I want to expand myself. It's not, and then you're not being mercenary about it. If you're just quitting money because you're for hire, that's different. If you're, if you're moving on because you want to progress, nobody can begrudge you. So, and then you just keep those lines of communication open. Um, there's a way to manage yourself. But if you quit from a place of bitterness, what makes people bitter is when you believe it's somebody else's job to take care of your career trajectory, right? I find mm-hmm. that happens. So people are like, Okay, but like I really like it here, but I want to, you know, be in charge of everything. Like, well, well, that's not going to happen just yet. You know, if you get bitter because of that, as opposed to taking agency and custody of your own, that that's what happens. If you leave and you're not bitter and you're just doing it to progress, eventually people don't begrudge that they admire that because they kind of mm-hmm. want to operate the same way you're operating, right? I, I know that's convoluted, but it's and it's a nuance, but it's so true. Expunge all bitterness because nobody owes you anything. You owe yourself everything. Yeah. And I would say do good work till the day you're gone. You know what I mean? Make sure they remember you on a high note. That's what I would say. Yeah. I, I'm in awe of hard work. Like I go to places and I see people working so hard and I'm like, I'm in awe. And, and I really mean this. I'll go to like hang out at my local 7-Eleven and be like, God, like you're working so hard. Like I find it so hard to smile today. You know, I'm going to be such a miserable boss and here you are cheerfully, you know, whatever, whatever context. So my point is people in positions of authority know anybody who is doing exceptional work at any level. And you will eventually catch the attention of somebody who's good natured, who wants to tap into your magic and promote you, elevate you. And if you mm-hmm. don't, then you quit. I, I love that advice. So let's talk about mortality, because I think this is a really interesting topic. You mentioned earlier that your mother passed away the first day that you were press secretary. I can relate. My father passed away the week that I started my company and we grew to 70 employees in our first year. He didn't see any of that, Mm -hmm. but it also really motivated me. The fact that he passed away because I realized that life is so short and that we only have one life and it, it made me really get myself into high gear. Um, and I knew that you also had testicular cancer, you know, in your thirties and that also you know, had you thinking about death, I'm sure. So what is your perspective on death? And, um, you know, how did those experiences shape you? Yeah, I think my first big experience with death was watching my mother um, pass away and just watching those like desperate last minutes, um, the bargaining that happens, to be honest with you. And this is, you know, sort of a, a tough detail, but just in the last the last couple of days, she was very heavy. She couldn't really get out of her chair. It's just beyond I couldn't even betray to you how miserable this environment was and oxygen tank and she was bargaining like she knew and I didn't realize I just thought it was another day in hell you know what I mean like when you're living in like a fever dream of of madness it's like oh this is just another day and she asked me not to go to work that day like please stay home and I'm like we have no money like I have to go to work I didn't know that day was any different than any other day in our living hell and so I watched the bargaining though in those last days of like I won't eat poorly anymore like you know and I didn't know she was bargaining with her maker And so I witnessed the regret, the overcoming dread you have at the end of life and thought, you know, wow, um, it really does can end terribly. My mother worked so hard to try to get somewhere in life, never even took a vacation or a plane and yet still died. And so, Mm -hmm. I I mean, I say that in such rawness because I don't want to gloss it over and like, but everything was fine. Like it was not fine and it was terrible. And she was worried about being discarded in life right after working so hard. So what that taught me is like you really have to be in touch with your mortality and take custody because it does end at any moment and no one's going to at the end of your life reconcile all the things that you didn't reconcile you know the bargaining phase so that's kind of point one two um having gone through cancer and uh going to sloan kettering i was only 20 no was i how old was i i don't even know maybe 32. i had just had my son and um and i remember once i my mortality, like I wasn't dying tomorrow. And I was like, I think we're gonna get through this. 
um, it, what it did is tell me how much of the things I think about every day don't hold up against the prospect of imminent death, which is interesting because I'm like, wait, the idea of death is hanging over us all the time. And yet I spend my time scrolling through New York Times classified sections looking for a bigger house. Like, I was like, oh, wow, so much of our thoughts are meaningless. And that's a gift to be aware of and hold on to. So it changed my perspective on mortality. Long story short, uh, you know, I have an app on my phone called We Croak, which is inspired by uh, the folks in Bhutan who uh, contemplate their own mortality five times a day. And what you find out when you think about your own mortality frequently, it's not a morbid, actually. It's peaceful because you, it relieves you of all the aggravation of the daily stresses because they just don't hold up against the prospect of death and mortality, which we all live on, live with. And you realize how much of our angst um, that we go through on a daily basis is trying to um, confuse ourselves or distract ourselves from the idea that we're, we don't know why we're here and we don't know where we're going. Now, for those who are very religious, maybe it's a little bit easier, but for the vast majority of people, like, we don't know what we're doing here and we don't know when it's going to end and we don't know where we're going. And so I think if we lock in on that, then you say, well, what do I know? Oh, the present. The present is the one thing that I'm guaranteed. The present is the one thing that feels so great and I'm so grateful for. And so I try to every day bring it back to Sloan Kettering, bring it back to the idea I might die and bring it back to the awareness that, uh, that the mortality and what, you know, what it, what it makes me do is like celebrate my wife, who's my best friend, celebrate my kids and just make like, who cares about this stupid email, this internecine interpolitical fight of nonsense crap that I'm dealing with. So I recommend everybody out there download that app. Kids think I'm crazy, by the way, especially when I read the quotes from somebody Voltaire about, you know, death, but, uh, but it works. We croak. It's called yeah. We Croak. Yeah. It's so interesting. Honestly, Matt, you are such a role model. I just want to take a second to just say, like, oh, wow. You. Like, you've done so much in your life. You've come over so much adversity. Your mother is probably so, so proud of you. So thank you. Congratulations. Now, can I tell you a little story since you, you're, you're like you're going so deep on it? Of course. It's an story, a positive note about my mom, because I feel like this is so can be so grim. But I went back to deliver um, the commencement of speech at my college. And I really wanted to do it because it's where my mother went to school. And when I was a little nine-year-old boy, some of the positive uh, memories I had were sitting in her classroom uh, in the back on a Saturdays, watching her sort of take custody of her life as a single mom. So big moment. It's only a couple of years ago. I'm only 43. They're giving me an honorary doctorate. So I went from mm-hmm. a PhD to a PhD. And I feel like this is my moment to inter my mother uh, soul on the campus and I'm going to honor her and the speech. I'm like, how am I going to get through this speech? Such a hard speech to give. So I'm walking in the procession, you know, with the, you know, all the gear and everything. And, um, there's a older professor, older gentleman interrupts the line, say, excuse me, I need to say something to Matt Higgins. And I see his face and it's the weirdest thing. I'm like, I recognize this face. And, I'm like, and he comes up because, Hey, I'm professor Dean Savage. I just want you to know that I had your mother as a student and she was the best student I ever had. And I'm like, Oh, that's the craziest, like a moment of, and he goes, I'm retiring tomorrow, but I needed to tell you before you gave your speech. I was like, and now I'm like crying. Like, oh. So, but what was interesting, she had always worried about being discarded. And here was this professor who 30 something years later is telling me that it was the best. And she would say he was the uh, best professor she ever had. So you can make a big impact on people, even if you have no money, no anything, just by being a good human being. So it ends well, I guess is my point of the start. I give the speech and, and now every year I have um, a group of single moms that I you know pay scholarships for for them to go to Queens College, which is so fun because these are like my LeBron Jameses of people like they're doing what my mom did. They're raising kids and they're going to college. All of them have incredible stories of fleeing, you know, abusive husband or, you know, dealing with, you know, substance abuse issues, whatever. And now they're going to college while they have little kids. And so. I sort of took my mom's legacy and I just transfer it now through through scholarships. That is just so amazing and so positive. <laughs> yeah. Cool it, <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, my my audience is used to like the ups and no, downs I, that I take them through. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, you know, you did so much more after this. You, you worked for the Jets for eight years. You, you did so much more. But let's let's fast forward to entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. And let's talk about how you got started in entrepreneurship. You say that Gary V was the genesis of all of that. So talk to us about how you met Gary V. What, what was that whole situation like? Yeah, I was um, I was uh, overseeing the New York Jets, the business of the team. 
um, and was probably my seventh, you know, year, eighth year doing it. And it was not my dream to become a sports executive for life. I used to always say I have everybody's dream job, but mine, I love the, <laughs> the organization, but I'm not like a rabid sports fan where I want to spend, you know, my whole life doing it, but it was a business and it was fun to run it high profile the whole bit. Um, and Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, was like, you know, this mythical YouTube wine guy. Uh, who everyone knew was a huge Jets fan and wanted to buy the team. So my guys were convinced that I could sell them a suite. And anybody knows anything about sports and entertainment, selling a suite is like impossible. But I, I told my guys, okay, I'll go, I'll go meet them in Springfield, New Jersey, and I'll try to sell them a suite. So we met for a bagel and a cup of coffee. And uh, well, everyone knows Gary Vaynerchuk or can easily now Google and see him 8 million hours of content. But I meet him and, you know, he's wild, wildly gesturing, I'm going to buy the Jets. And, and he's, you know, whatever, he's still out of his mind. We're like, with what money are you going to buy the Jets? But then, you know, and I, I, I pride myself on doing this. Like, I can look past the packaging and, and, and say, and just listen to the quality of the thoughts and the predictions. And in that 30 minutes, Gary laid out a vision for the future that played out. And it and it spoke. It sounded like truth to me. So, for example, this is two thousand nine. This is when Twitter is just kind of like taking off. He's like, "Look, the future of the world involves every single person will be HBO and Comcast. They will be both the content producer and the content distributor. The entire world is going to change, and these big stupid corporations are not going to be able to keep up with it. And they're going to be battleship carriers, and I'm going to be I'm going to build a speedboat. And my little brother AJ, once he graduates college, we're going to build a firm together. It's going to be amazing. We're going to manage people's social digital. And by the end of the thirty, I was like, I think Gary like sees the future, and if I could figure out how to partner with him, we can unlock great things. And at that preface, we cut a deal. Why don't we do this? Why don't we take one player on the team and you'll manage their social media and you'll make them like Twitter famous. And if that goes well, I'll become the first client of what was to become VaynerMedia. And he did. We actually did social for a player, Kerry Rhodes, went and had dinner with, he was a safety at the Jets, went and had dinner with him. And, Jerry, and Gary did a great job managing it. And VaynerMedia was born, gave him four Jets tickets to become uh, the first <laughs> client. And then when I left the Jets and started up my own venture firm, went back and acquired uh, almost 40% of the firm. And we've been partners ever since. And the firm is, you know, probably the largest social media digital first uh, firm in the country. So well, the moral of that story to me um, is, is when you spot greatness, figure out how you can unlock it. And in so doing, you can also change your own life, right? Like Gary's my brother. I've had tremendous success, you know, uh, partly because of him in a lot of ways, not entirely because of him. I've done other things, but he's changed my life. And, and I believe that I made a huge contribution to his. Yeah, it's so cool. Gary V is such an idol of mine. I actually grew up right next to Springfield, New Jersey. And so I've been following Gary V for so long. Wachung, New Jersey. Oh, you're, you're, yeah. yeah, you're a little bit west of me. So, yeah, a beautiful, beautiful. Town. Yeah. Where are you from? Um, well, all over, but uh, basically uh, Chatham Summit area. Oh, wow. Is that where you live now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. We should have done this in person. <laughs> Wait, That's so still, funny. Are you still in Watchung? Uh, right now, I'm about to move to Jersey City, but I'm in Watchung uh, temporarily. But that's so funny that we're like 10 right. minutes away from each other and doing a remote interview. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> that's so funny. So I know you and Gary are doing an NFT project. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us about this project and what you think about in terms of the future of NFTs? Yeah, I think um, I have gone deep into NFTs. Well, first, like so many people listening to this over the age of 30, dismissed it. <laughs> like, JPEGs? Like, what? What am I really buying? And I remember Gary, it wasn't that long ago, it was during the pandemic, I had dinner with him and he's like, open your phone right now and you are going to buy five CryptoPunks right now and they are gonna be worth an extraordinary amount of money. And you know, and whatever, I'm like, I opened my phone, I'm like, I'm not buying this. Like, are you out of your money with like 30 grand at the time? I was like, this is silly. Um, <laughs> of course, big mistake, right? Like Julia Robertson, you know, that she walks out, big mistake. So I, <laughs> I should not have done that. Um, but anyway, I pride myself on reflecting, especially when I get things wrong. It's not that I didn't think they might take off, it just didn't feel like it was, you know, for me. And, and in the summer, I had a little bit of a window, uh, free time. I decided to go deep down the rabbit hole and just really understand, like, what is the fundamental activity happening here with NFTs? Like, is there something there? And I just became convinced that the metaverse is going to transform the universe, that this underlying activity around NFTs appeals to so many different things that resonate with people. It appeals to our desire to collect, right, rare items. It, it, it appeals to our desire to have prestige 
and have a rare thing and portray that, you know, to an external audience, it appeals to the desire to gamble, to be honest, right? Like, and to invest and to, and to be part of a community, which is the easy part to dismiss. If you don't spend time on Discord in, in a, around an NFT project, you don't understand what's happening with NFTs. If you mm-hmm. do and you immerse yourself and you see how enriching it could be to go deep into an NFT community, you begin to understand it. And then gaming. I think that um, NFT gaming is going to be a multi-billion dollar industry um, and it's happening in real time and it's so easy to miss. So for fun, I've been onboarding people of you know all different stripes to uh, different NFT projects that I really like. And what I find across the board, one, everybody becomes addictive. Like, I don't care if you're a lawyer, a CEO, you're a skinnick, a septic, a curmudgeon, you know, a skeptic, <laughs> a curmudgeon. Like, it, it, it has a certain gravitational pull, and that tells me that it, it, it's pretty significant. So I think um, OpenSea could be the next Amazon, and there's going to be basically an arms race to figure out which becomes the winning platform. And in particular, NFT gaming is just going just gonna to explode. That's so the super. Point on Gary, on Gary, it was just that we create our own NFT fund together, and we've been, you know, putting money to work. Is that already launched your NFT fund yeah, with Gary? Yeah, already launched. We've been at it for. We kind of keep it sort of quiet. You know, we don't brand it. We don't. We just we just do what we do. You know, and and, and invest in projects. Uh, we're in Axie. We're in a ton of different things. We I feel like we pick pretty great. We also buy some art. So uh, we own we own we own an ape. Uh, like uh which has done pretty well um in crypto punks but my only point for those out there uh like don't don't dismiss it dismiss it at your own peril actually spend some time and have fun with it and you'll discover that it's quite real and this is this is the internet 1996. Yeah. So how how would you suggest that somebody actually get started? You mentioned go on Discord, which for those who don't know, it's a, a social audio app. So go on Discord, start listening to some conversations. Most people don't have 30 grand lying around I mean, you know, to, to invest in. No, yeah. So like, what's the what's like a investment amount that we should think about? And also, how does somebody get involved? OK, great question. So just point number one, um, remember, uh, complexity is a proxy for opportunity because it means it's early. So it is literally ridiculous to onboard yourself into the metaverse. Uh, it's so abstract and you get so mad, like, why do I need a coin, Coinbase app? And then like, what the hell is MetaMask? And what do I, what is a wallet? I have a wallet, you know, like, all right, so you need to like shake it off. You know, it's like, and go into this knowing like, it's so stupid how hard it is, but that's the opportunity because in 1996, I had all these ideas for like these domain names and I was like, I'm gonna do it. And then I didn't bother going through the process to register them because it was so complicated. And there went millions of dollars out the door. So stick with it. So point number one, if you can find a friend who's into it, so probably a gamer, somebody in your world has gone into, they, they might be 12 years old, but somebody in your universe has gone deep, ask them to mentor you and onboard you. Everybody will do it because they want the population to grow. So if you, but if you don't happen to have that person, it's a couple of simple steps. You download uh, you know, the Coinbase app, right? You send some money to Coinbase. Now you learn the world of annoying fees, but you, you send some money to Coinbase. And then you download MetaMask, which is your wallet. You need these two things. Don't use the Coinbase wallet, in my opinion. It's not good. The MetaMask wallet and send some uh, a coin because you'll convert your cash to Ethereum. And then mm-hmm. you send some Ethereum to MetaMask. Now you're in. You will buy an NFT through the platform called OpenSea. That's where that's the Amazon of NFTs at the moment. And your MetaMask is holds your money called Ethereum. And that's where you'll buy your NFT there. You, there's tons of projects where you can spend a few hundred bucks to get started. You don't need to spend thousands. You want to do your research first by downloading Discord. If you like some pretty objects, you know, just spend some time. Look at the depth of the community, the passion around the community. Do the developers of the project do what they say they're going to do? Everybody puts out uh, what's called a roadmap. Most of them are full of shit. So just like you want to like look for these little signals of execution and whatnot. But you don't need thousands of dollars to get started with that. I would say the opposite. Like you can do it for a couple hundred bucks and, and do what's called minting, which means you're there from day one where you buy an NFT from the beginning. So I know what I said is complicated. I wanted to give you at least the, the general framework. No, it's super helpful, actually. YouTube. But I think the, the easiest way. So what I do now, I sort of 
what's what's I'm gonna I'm gonna get it wrong, but you know, you teach somebody to fish, right? They give, they'll have food for the rest of their life. So anybody I bring in, my friends from Queens, I'll like teach them NFT, NFT land. But they have one obligation, which is to onboard somebody else that I send to them. So now I just I've created this you know this group of people that onboard other people. So find somebody. Very very cool. And honestly, you you decomplicated it. It's, it sounds a lot easier than I thought it would be, although more steps than I realized in terms of like how you have to like push where you have to get your money and how you have to buy it. But it, it, it seems doable. And to your point, that's the opportunity. The fact that it's so hard and so few people are going to actually get in early because they're going to be overwhelmed by it instead of just you know, figuring it out step by step. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give, and again, I'm going to simplify this. So it's not yeah. so complicated, but because it is so early and so few people doing things, but so many new ways of transactions have been opening up just to make one simple example. Um, all these games and platforms produce their own coins, their own cryptocurrency, so to speak, that mm-hmm. have utility within their world. You could use this coin to buy, you know, a, a new type of skin for the NFT to change its color, whatever the utility of the coin is, right? But in order to stabilize the coin, they need what's called liquidity pools, just something to back up these things. There's a whole ecosystem out there where people are basically providing liquidity to these pools and earning 20%, 30%, 40% APY. Like it is so early. So my, my message is it, here I am, I teach at HBS, I'm supposedly an adult. Ideally, I've gone through my trauma and reconciled myself, whatever. I'm like a teenage child playing with NFTs. So there's something there is my only point. Don't dismiss it. You've definitely changed my mind, I have to say. Okay. Um, so, well, by the way, I'm going to onboard you as a case study. So by the second, I would love to. Then I'm literally, when we're done, I'm going to set you up so that the next time you're doing a, a podcast, we'll see if I've uh, made you addicted to it or at least a believer in, uh, in it. Yeah, I'd love that. Um, so let's talk about RSE Ventures. This is something real. Uh, it's a private investment firm that you started. You're the CEO and yeah. you've uh, helped companies like Warby Parker. What are the other companies that you've worked on with this? Actually, Warby Parker is my partner, Jesse. He did that one. Oh. But no, but generally speaking, like big picture, the, the, the genesis of it was when you own a sports team, you have so much access to deal flow. So you have mm-hmm. an inbound that you could take advantage of. You also have perspective. Um, you see a lot of emerging consumer trends. Uh, you see Pinterest maybe before others might, right? Like you see Snapchat taking hold because these are huge audiences uh, sports teams have around them. And those emerging technologies are always pitching those sports teams to basically tap into them when offering equity. And so the epiphany I had with the Jets was like, we should be monetizing those insights. We should be backing these technologies, but also we then should be using the sports team as a Petri dish basically to go ahead and help them, you know, gain traction. So that was the general insight. So RC was born around the Miami Dolphins in early days, and it's morphed into a pretty significant portfolio of great consumer brands. So our formula is generally a great founder, a Gary V type or whomever, who um, has some degree of magic, is going against convention and could use some support in some way to scale, right? So in the food context, that would be Christina Tosi of Milk Bar has been my partner. Um, we spun that company off from Momofuku with Dave Chang, its own independent company, funded it, scaled it. Now, if you walk down Whole Foods three years later, you'll see milk bar cookies everywhere, right? That's mm-hmm. that's a reflection of my work with Christina Tosi and my team at RSC. Um, we own Magnolia Bakery, which we acquired. Um, I'm giving all the good food stuff because <laughs> like that's more interesting than some of the other things. But But really, that's the approach. I wanted to take this interventionist, empathetic approach to founders and figure out how to unlock people's potential. Like I know what you get excited about doing in your life is similar to what I get excited about. Like I wish somebody had unlocked me when I was going through whatever I was going through. So I just enjoy identifying like magic and saying, oh, what would it take to truly amplify whatever it is you're great at, whatever it is that makes you beautiful? And and I get to kind of play with it kind of behind the scenes. It's it's why I don't talk much about the Gary partnership, because the truth is like there's only one Gary and Gary is Gary. Like my role is, is, is minor and I enjoy the minor, the role behind the curtain, not behind the curtain, because that's not true, behind the scenes, um, mm-hmm. helping, helping scale. So that's what I do across the portfolio. Version 1.0 is building things from scratch. We helped launch uh, Resi. Uh, uh, the inc- we incubated that with Ben Leventhal and Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, and now it's about owning significant stakes and great consumer brands. 
And Resi is like a restaurant software or something like yeah, that. He's a competitor to Open Table that was born uh, like I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago at this point, and then was sold to Amex. And now uh, uh, Amex owns Resi. But in the early days of RSC, we would build the companies from scratch or work with founders from scratch. That gets hard to do over and over again. Like you'll have a very short life if you keep doing that. So now it's more a little bit more mature, significant interest, and then uh, helping uh, scale. But more recently, I've been backing great mature brands that I uh, that I come across through investing in digital uh, native companies or teaching at it at Harvard. So uh, I backed Dapper Labs, which is a big NFT platform company. Thrasio recently invested in. Uh, OpenSea is another one. So. Uh, but because it's uh, our own investment vehicle, don't report to the Wall Street, don't report to other investors. It's just a partnership. We have the ability to back whatever we find that's interesting. That's so cool. Uh, can we understand something? And it might be a dumb question, to be honest. But how, do, how, how does uh, the owner of a sports team or managing a sports team, how does that lead to a lot of deal flow? Like you being exposed to a lot of deal flow. I don't quite understand that. So... I think entrepreneurs, when they have a consumer facing technology, for whatever reason, they're always drawn to sports and entertainment to a lesser extent. But if you think about like, uh, uh, you know, a big artist, a big artist doesn't really have a platform to communicate or put a brand in front of their their fan base. Right. But a sports team does. They reach millions of people like Real Madrid. Right. Has like 100 million people following. Mm -hmm. So it's a natural place for a Snapchat in early days or any kind of social platform or e -com platform to want to tap into to get in front of that group. So you have a you can see them pretty early. And often in those early days, the imprimatur of a sports team or a league is so valuable that they're willing to do equity deals in those early days. That phenomenon will carry on forever because you have a captive audience that's very loyal. So if, you know, the NFL or the NBA backs like the NBA did with Dapper Labs early, that gives Dapper Labs a massive, you know, opportunity, right? So that's that's really it. It's just people trying got to get that dedicated uh, core fan base. Got it, got it. Okay, let's talk about VCs and, and teach my audience some stuff about VCs. So aside from just giving money to people, what are the non-financial things that a VC or a private investment firm would do for an entrepreneur? Oh, great question. Um, I think money, ideally money is just way down the list because money is money and you can find money in a lot of places. Um, it really depends if the entrepreneur is self-aware and reflective, which to me is the whole ball game, right? Um, I, I think a, a VC who's been down the road before, especially a VC who's been an operator, can be tremendously valuable. And so I would say to those, I have a, a tremendous bias towards people who have operating experiences because they will be much more sympathetic to the, tr the struggles you're going through and much more realistic. Like it's, it's easy when you think the answers are on an Excel sheet, but the Excel sheet doesn't tell you anything. Like all the issues you have to, to deal with as a entrepreneur are really about people and trying to get the most out of people, trying to deal with people, trying to navigate around people. Like, so I, I to, 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 to make that a little, you know, more, more explicit, like a, a great VC investor is somebody you could come to and say, I'm really struggling to fill this position. I need a COO. I feel like I can't handle it all, but it's such a hard person to hire because I have this delicate culture in my office and, you know, and Sally and Mark are competing for the top spot, you know, whatever, whatever the issue is, that VC will help you source that person or will help you synthesize that fact pattern. So to me, number one, it's a place where you can frankly be vulnerable. Like, and, and oftentimes that's the whole ball game. Like if you could be vulnerable with somebody, your investor, your spouse, your partner, you then can get through whatever it is you're dealing with. If you need to sort of hold back, because if you're sharing your vulnerability, you're gonna be criticized for it or judged for it, um, you really can't make progress. So a great VC will create a safe space where you can share your problems, hiring, you know, fundraising, product, everything that's going wrong. Because if you could voice what's going wrong, you can go ahead and figure out uh, what to do about it. Because I always think the number one predictor I have for whether an entrepreneur is going to be successful is the amount of time it takes them to make a decision that's already become objectively inevitable. In other words, like this product is going to fail. Like it's clear the market has spoken. How long will it take you to kill it and acknowledge it and shift directions? And so many things will get in the way of making that decision. Fear of being judged. You know what I mean? Like you know, if we don't have another answer, you know, too big of an ego. So I think when you have the, the right level of self-awareness and a confidence and humility to pivot and iterate when you're backed by people that won't judge you for it, 
it makes it a lot easier and a lot faster to make those pivots. But I've seen the reverse when you have a bunch of investors, you know, wearing their Patagonia vests and staring at the spreadsheets, you know, never had a never had an operating job in their life and like just in it for the money and they make your life living hell because they don't know what they're talking about because they never had to hire somebody, fire somebody, they never mm. they've never been on the line. They just learned about it in a classroom. Like, I don't know. So I have, as you could tell, a strong bias towards people with true operating experience as investors. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. If you've never done it before, how can you give somebody advice who's doing it right now? It's it's pretty hard to do. Your, your advice will be cerebral or theoretical, but it's not going to be it's not going to be practical. Yeah. So how do you have time for all of this? I mean, I like I said, I'm a huge fan of Shark Tank and you were on two seasons and all the sharks are investing in so many companies. And I always wonder, like, I, I would probably want an investor I don't have an investor for my company right now. I've bootstrapped the whole thing, right? And I think (laughs) that's my that's my upcoming question. All right, we'll get to that. (laughs) Okay, so you know, if you have five hundred companies that you're invested in, how do you have time for all that? And obviously, you know, people are going to start to take priority, and and other people will fall to the wayside. So, how do you deal with all of that? And if you're an entrepreneur looking for an investor, should you look for someone who doesn't have their star yet because you might want to be that star for them, if you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it is hard at the end of the day because, you know, you take on more, you have less capacity. Um, I think part of my objective is to render myself obsolete wherever that's an option, right? So whether that means hiring a really great person, I really don't try to hold on to things. I try to let them go when my, when I'm no longer useful. I kind of only tend to want to go where I'm useful uh, and serve a purpose. And when I don't, I'm just not that interested. So uh, unfortunately, you know, that can make me very like, all right, well, there's no more problems here. So I don't really need to work on this right now. Right. Like we're, we're, we're good. So that's number one. Two, I'm very intentional about my time. People always say, oh, you're doing so much. I'm like, I'm, I'm very, very intentional about what I do. There is nothing that I do in a given day that wasn't thought through and wasn't through being really intentional. I try to set boundaries around the things that matter most to me. So I have a lot of room to roam elsewhere. So in other words, my kids are the most important thing in my life. You know, my wife happens to be my best friend. So I don't have a need for a ton of friends and like see someone I want to hang out with. So I, I've constructed my life in a way that enables me to have a lot of room to roam outside of those really hard boundaries around the things that matter most to me. And then three, I scale. So I'm always scaling, trying to set myself up to level up beyond that. And yet I'm really hard on myself about, am I doing what I said I was gonna do? Am I executing on the things I took on? Because I don't have a lot of respect for people who, you know, my, my partner calls it as a grasshopper, you jump from thing to thing. So I'm constantly auditing like, wait, you said you were gonna do this. You took this on, are you doing it? And if you're no longer interested in doing it, have you leveled with everyone saying, I'm going to move on now, right? So, but it, you made a great point. It is a delicate balance. And like, I always, I'm sure I'm, I'm always pissing somebody off saying, oh, I'm going to get a hold of you. I miss you. You know, I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm just, <laughs> trying, I'm just trying to do something bigger, you know, like, I mean, so yeah, it's a great question. I think I've come to believe that the joy of living is in the striving. It's my formula for happiness. I figured it out. I ran my first more marathon. I finished. And I was like, why am I so depressed? I'm like, oh, it was the training. So life is. <laughs> and so I, I tell I communicate that to people like, oh, this is how I'm wired. I really enjoy the pressure and the stress and, and the evolution. You know, I never taught a day in my life. I worked for almost a year to have the opportunity to teach at Harvard Business School. That's life changing. So on the, with that comes a degree of shedding of other responsibilities in order to level up. Yeah, I mean, that's just the way the cookie crumbles. Like, yeah. it is what it is, you know, and you got to focus where there's promise and the other entrepreneurs maybe hopefully get a competitive kick out of that, too, and maybe level up themselves, you know? So mm-hmm. I think... And I, and I also think that, like, I, I give this advice to people, too. Nobody wants to go on a rescue mission. When you're, when you're trying to solicit support from whether it's a new investor or an existing investor, like come up with discrete, actionable items that are impactful, that make a difference because everybody's guarding their energy and their time, right? So I feel like it's on everyone else too to sort of extract from you what's most impactful, but leave you with enough bandwidth to do what you want to do, right? As opposed to coming to be like, I think we're out of money. (laughs) Like in two weeks, I'm like, oh, okay. So (laughs) what's the plan? And I do get some of that in my life too. I'm like, come on, 
that. Really? Like, wait, yeah. you, you really are saying you want me to go on a rescue mission? Like, you don't think I have a million other things going on in my life? <laughs> because I, I get that in my, I tend to get overly involved and I, I do feel like I've been through a lot. So people come to me, which I love. But then when people just come to me with a problem without even like a fact pattern that might get us out of it, I can't, I can't stand that. You know? Yeah. Can't waste your time. You're a busy man, Matt. Right. So let's let's talk about um, when we should look for funding. So I'll give you my example. So yeah. I bootstrapped my company. I started my company as a side hustle while I was working at Disney streaming services in marketing. And I grew it for six months. By the time I quit, I had 35 employees all over the world. <laughs> and now we've, you know, we've hit two million in revenue in our first year. And I don't need an investor. My cu my customers are effectively, you know, funding my company. I hit my first my first real client was paying me 30k a month and I feel like he was my seed investor. Wow. Um, you know, all my clients are kind of like billionaires, millionaires who I run social media and their podcasts for. And yeah, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes we think about should I, you know, change the structure of my company and figure out how we uh, get investors and start raising money. I'm a really good salesperson. And a lot of people tell me I should go down that path and, and figure that out and, and start raising money. And then, you know, internally, we're kind of just like, well, we could probably take this all the way, like <laughs> how we're doing it, you know? So what are your thoughts there? When should somebody actually consider an investor? I mean, we everything about us is hiring good talent. So if I got money, it would be about hiring better and better people and having unlimited amount of money to invest, uh, you know, innovate new products and hire better people. So what are your thoughts? So a uh, great question, which everybody should grapple with if they don't, because to bypass this critical question, you know, you could end up in a, in a place you never intended to be. Right. So I always think a lot of the, the a lot of our dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction in life doesn't come from the wrong answers. It comes from the wrong question or failing to ask the question at all. So this is the question. Should I scale with investment or should I, you know, bootstrap? I think it comes down to what's the goal? What makes you content? We I found this even when I when I teach at HBS, it's like we have this presumption that the object of the exercise is to create a business worth one hundred million dollars or a billion like and to have these markers where it's so hard to make one dollar into two, you know, and to sort of be on your own, a completely autonomous, no boss and feed yourself. Like I marvel at that, like, wow, you went out. So you're already doing it. Like, I think, you know, like you won. So then the question is, what does winning look like to you? Winning to me looks like you're already successful on your own, but winning to you might be like, I really want a big exit. I want an exitable business. A lot of times when you want an exitable business, that can get that you do need the capital in order to scale bigger and so sort of faster. So to me, that's always the threshold question. And then it's the theory of the case. What what is it? My what, is, what kind of leverage am I really going to get at a at a dollar in today that I couldn't achieve on my own by growing organically? So if you told me that there you're going to start this new you know um, uh, media property right and you needed to raise five hundred thousand dollars to create this media property but with that 500 grand you're going to be within the next three months able to hire 10 people you're going to launch it you're going to get it up to 10 million impressions a month within a year and you're going to get you know a whatever 5x multiple on yada 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 and now that thing's worth 20 million bucks and that matters to me like that would make sense because it's going to take you a long time to generate $500,000 in, in free cash flow to fund that media property, number one. Two, if you said, and this idea is really time sensitive because if I don't do this media property today, somebody else is going to do it, so I need cash, right? So it's a blend of what's my objective? Do I want an exitable business? Because oftentimes if I do, I probably do need to create, you know, raise capital. What's the leverage I can get on a dollar in today? And is there an urgency that requires me to scale now as opposed to scale organically? Mm. Uh -huh. Those are all super great thoughts that I'm going to noodle on. Yeah, that's for me. I'm just like, I don't know if I need an investor yet. I feel like I need some like other huge idea that I need funding for, because oh. as of now, I'm able to kind of pay for what I need. Well, as I of think on an agency, if you're going to run a pure agency, then, you know, most of the time, the answer is you don't need investment. You build it or again, you, you win the contract you hire. You hire, slight, once you have some more free cash flow, you can hire slightly ahead of demand because you know yep. the demand will come. I think that's the biggest, that's a bigger threshold for an for a entrepreneur who's building an agency to overcome the willingness to hire slightly ahead of demand and have the confidence to know demand will come. I believe mm -hmm. 
philosophically that problems beget solutions and people have it all wrong. People think solutions beget the willingness to undertake a problem because you've identified how you're going to solve it. I do the opposite. I like to create the problem for myself and then know that we have an infinite capacity to get ourselves out of situations. Mm -hmm. And so I place myself in a problem. So to you, I'd say, I'm going to hire three people. I'm not sure how I'm going to pay them, but I know I trust myself. I'm going to get the business yep. to pay them. That's more important than taking an outside capital, actually. When That's exactly them. what we're doing right now. And I'm just like booking sports uh, start dates and months ahead. And I know the clients are coming. And I mean, Gary V, when Gary did his deal with me back in the day, um, it, that money didn't go into the firm. It just went to him and to AJ. So truth, Vayner Media is a really 100% bootstrapped. We mm. little bit of money went into acquire pure out, but really actually Gary, Gary built that like with the hustle of getting clients and stuff like that. So it can, it can be done. Um, the biggest thing to overcome is the willingness to hire ahead of hire ahead of demand. Yeah, it's so true. It's so funny. That's exactly what we're going through right now. Um, okay. So I, do I have a future in this? Should I go yes. Let's talk. Let's talk. I, Let's I, talk. I, listen, Vayner Media has always been my dream. Don't get me started. I'm about to be on Claude Silver's podcast too. Oh, Claude so, such a sweetheart, by the way. Yeah, she's so nice. She's been on my podcast. She was on my podcast like a year or two ago, and now I'm going on hers. So I'm yeah. excited. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about entrepreneurs um, and what you look for in an entrepreneur. So let's start there, and then I have a couple of follow up questions. Okay. Um, uh, so maybe I put on kind of the Shark Tank context, but I think it applies to everything mm -hmm. from my time when I was on Shark Tank. I look for probably signals more than anything. I really believe, I think the Italians have a phrase, you know, the fish rots from the head. I just think everything is about um, the integrity of the mind and the alignment of everything going on in your head. And, and so I spend a lot of energy really trying to look under the hood. Uh, and what am I looking for? I'm looking for number one, like I mentioned earlier, self-awareness in an entrepreneur. And it's like, those sound like empty words, but we all can, can pick up, um, we can pick up signals of self-awareness. One of them being, for example, if you're on the set of Shark Tank, uh, will you acknowledge that you don't know something? Do you have the confidence to say you don't know something? I'm looking for conviction though. I'm looking for somebody who doesn't simply capitulate to me because that's expedient. So how would that show up on Shark Tank? Cuban would say like, your name sucks for this company or your packaging stinks after like, we've looked at it for 10 seconds and a person's like, with all due respect, like I actually think, and here's why, as opposed to, sure, I'll change it, whatever you want, I just want you to be my partner. So I look for a degree of conviction, right? I also look for humility, use of the we in the language rather than I all the time, those little signals that say to somebody, and the reason why that matters, not, not because I want you to be the nicest person in the world, people will follow others who bring them along, right? So mm -hmm. if it's all gonna be about I, 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 that tells me your ego is very fragile, you may be a narcissist, you're gonna be unable to recruit people to your cause, including vendors and employees, and you're gonna be less successful. So I look for that that conviction, I look for the self-awareness, right? I look for the ability to bring other people around, right? And of course, I look for mastery of subject matter. Uh, people who are looking to like delegate everything or outsource it, who don't have respect for what happens in the weeds, you know, who don't wanna sort of sit in the stream of data, they tend to not be successful over time you know, so I really do look for a degree of um, willingness to be involved in minutia, right? And, I, and the things that get away with that be ego, well, it's beyond me, or I just want to outsource all that. So I look for mastery of the facts. I can be unforgiving if I think there's something you really should know and you don't know. That does say I do judge that pretty harshly. So if somebody were to go on Shark Tank, for example, and they're starting a restaurant or whatever, or somebody comes to me and I ask them, what's your four wall? You know, what's your COGS, right? What's your occupancy cost? All these things are really important when you have a restaurant, a uh, food business. Your occupancy cost, for example, should be no higher than 10% of your total gross revenue. If you tell me you're the chef, I kind of just handle the food. I leave that to Bill to do it. It's like, no, 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 like food, like we'll just cook in your kitchen. Like the option you have to <laughs> here is to make a profit on your restaurant. So I can be unforgiving when you don't have mastery of the things I believe you should. I could also be unforgiving if you bullshit me and act like you do when you don't. You know what I mean? Mm, so mm -hmm. it's new one. We could do this all day about what I'm looking for. But my overall point of this uh, philosophical discourse is I try to get under the hood of the head. I'm um, the worst deals I've ever done in my life are when I partner up with a private equity firm and they've got like you know billions of dollars under management and they bring in all these experts to do these expert reports. And then like I, I'll go into the <laughs> field on day one. I'm like, did you notice? that the CEO is delusional. <laughs> like, I mean, the reports are really great, but like a great product will never, you know, eclipse or overcompensate for a bad 
CEO, a bad founder, right? Whereas the other thing is true, is actually the reverse is actually true. A, a great founder can eclipse a really, you know, bad idea and iterate to a better one, but the reverse is never true. It's so interesting. So something else that I've heard you say is that you feel like entrepreneurs today might be too overconfident. And that's because they have Google, they can search anything, you know, anybody can be an entrepreneur. You don't need an office, you have Slack, you have Zoom. So how can we prevent ourselves from being overconfident? And why do you think that entrepreneurs are so overconfident these yeah, days? Well, I think number one, uh, I think we do a disservice to some extent because we fetishize this idea of being an entrepreneur and like it's mm-hmm. now the hierarchy, you know, everybody wants to be the hoodie wearing, you know, well, maybe not Mark Zuckerberg, but like, you know, there's, there's a mythology around uh, entrepreneurism, which, and because everyone has the ability to have a side hustle, we confuse side hustle with the idea of having a business. And so there's just not a lot of honesty about the drudgery and the pain of what it takes to create a business, but also the skill sets that are required to be successful. I mean, you know this because you've had to manage people now. If you are passive aggressive as a leader, you'll ultimately fail because you're gonna hate the conflict. You're not gonna be able to tell people and give them feedback. You're not gonna be able to manage, you know, hire slow, fire fast, all the things that go into be, you know, a great leader. So my point being, we've made entrepreneurism sound a lot easier and more accessible than it is. And we've also made people feel bad if they don't have an idea or, or you know, some creative impact. We've almost um, devalued uh, what it means to be part of a team and how precious that is to serve for the greater good, how valuable, you know, mm-hmm. that is. And so those are my kind of my, my big overall takeaways. And as a result, we place uh, less of a premium on experience, you know, yeah. and, and, and I think that's Everything about life boils down to pattern recognition skills. Ultimately, that is your greatest um, that is your greatest gift about getting older. Downside of getting older is we get more, you know more wrinkly and maybe we don't process information as fast. The upside is our pattern recognition skills are way stronger with every year of growth we have, and it takes us less time to recognize a pattern. So we tend to now discount that. Um, we discount age. I'm not saying this because now I'm a little older. I really believe in it. We discount. Uh, the, the growth and the pattern recognition that comes with that. And I see it shows up in entrepreneurs a little bit like, well, I, I mean, I have Google. I mean, I already know that. I'm like, no, it's different from knowing something in the abstract and having it imprinted on your core tech. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm saying. And that was a very long way of saying it. No, yeah, I totally agree. I don't know if this exactly relates, but I, I understand what you're saying because when I was 25, I, I was a first time entrepreneur and I failed. I had great brand. I was, you know, almost got a show on MTV, all this cool stuff, but I couldn't monetize what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. Then I ended up you know, going into corporate and I had a lot of years in corporate and then became an entrepreneur. And now I'm successful because I had those experiences to learn off the back of another company, basically uh, big companies. Right? right. And so I like what I tell people on my show is like, don't be like, let's say you're you failed as an entrepreneur. Don't be like too cool or something to go get a real job after that and and learn from somebody else who's doing it right. Yeah, you I mean, know, 100 percent. I am an amalgam of that, that which came before. It would be impossible I mean, now to pull in a little bit of booze of Buddhism, right? Like, what is a book? Is the book the words on the page? The author who wrote the book, the tree that created the book, the water that fed the tree? I don't know. So <laughs> I'm an amalgam of all that which came before. And a lot of that included jobs, drudgery, you know, also getting it wrong. When in my 20s, when my whole identify, all identity was about being like Doogie Hauser and, you know, younger than everything, right? And also just being the hero, you know, took care of his mom and all this, like, that was my whole construct of my personality. It didn't involve working through other people. In fact, like, I just was like, let me just tell everybody what to do because I have the answers kind of, and I don't mean that in like an egotistical way. That's just was the formula, right? And then as I get older, I get so excited to submit to the greatness of others. I love being humbled by somebody's magic. Like Gary, for example, you know, to use him, He's so self-possessed, like, and so he sleeps eight hours. I'm like, God, if I could sleep two hours, like, he's so reconciled to who he is as a person, whether you like him or not, he doesn't care. And I, I'm amazed by that. I get to submit to the greatness of his self-possession. I seek out opportunities to do that everywhere professionally. So that has unlocked more value for me and my family and my professional success than, than my 20s when I thought that I was the... You know what I mean? The star of the show. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's my point. It took time for me to know that. It took pattern recognition for me to realize 
I think I'm more successful when I submit to the greatness of others than when I ruminate my own success, right? Like I yeah. get further and seem to enjoy life when I'm humbled by somebody else's mastery of a topic because it tells me that I have more room to grow. There's another marathon to finish, right? I haven't hit the ceiling on uh, myself. And so long way of saying that we, we unfortunately devalue experience and pattern recognition, which doesn't mean, you know, simmer down, young person. It just means value, seek out what you don't know and get excited when you discover that you didn't know something. Yeah. So as we wind down, I have a couple more questions for you. Hopefully you still have some time. Sure. Um, so there's this thing called the great resignation happening right now where 40 percent of the workforce after covid has decided to become an entrepreneur i'm one of those people right started a business during covid what do we do as startup businesses and small businesses especially service-based businesses to actually recruit people to work for us when there's so many people who don't want to work anymore they're either getting a, a welfare check or uh, maybe that's not the right word, but some sort of a check from the government and, you know, or they're trying to start their own business and they're not interested in working for someone else. So do you have any tips for actually recruiting entry level employees? No, it's fascinating what's happening and quite real. I mean, it's a combination of different forces at work. It's this this sort of notion that like we don't have to go back to work that everything can function on you know on 60 percent optimization like that's eventually going to show up somewhere mm -hmm. um, but that's number one two i think it's partly a reflection of the moment in time where the all clear has not been issued right and we're we're in this sort of this interstitial where uh, like you kind of wear a mask when you walk into the restaurant, but then if you sit at the bar, you can take it off, even though you're surrounded by a hundred people, like nothing makes any sense. And so we're still, I think, reconciling the aftermath. If we were in the movie, you know, we would still be gathering for the big speech in Independence Day, but like the speech hasn't happened yet. So what my point is, this can't last, right? It won't last. Um, this notion that we can have absolutely everything is not true because eventually people will want to get ahead, will want to put in more time, whatever. Um, I think the part that is permanent is uh, frictionless behavior in the workplace and in our home life. So what I mean by that is like, no one's going back to commuting for no purpose. If there's no mm -hmm. purpose of being in the office, you cannot get people to come to the office. And so what I love now is the idea that, that so many meetings the default is still Zoom. So the amount of you know energy that that unlocks, the amount of productivity is pretty extraordinary. But the reality is I actually don't have answers on the recruiting front. I've encountered the same exact thing. I'm amazed by some of the things people will say. They'll be like, I mean, I'm really interested, but I, you know, I've been taking up the scuba diving class, so I just kind of feel like I want to. <laughs> I'm like, what? what, what's going on? I just think in another six months, it doesn't look like this. It does yeah. look like a hybrid. I do think that the all clear, I think it's important for our leaders politically to say, all right, we've hit a threshold. It's time that we get going again. You know, where's the, well, come on, America. Like, let's get back to it. You know, like we, we got to get out of the state of suspended animation. Um, I think it happens in six months is my gut. So I for, hope so. Uh, so. For those who hear this, this little time capsule, we are in the year uh, 2021. What, what's the date today? So we tell everybody. October 21st. All right, October 21st. So I think by, I'm going to give myself by to next May, by next May, we're back to normal, not to back to how it was. We're back to normal with a hybrid where people are all working and out and going about our lives again. Oh my gosh, I hope so. But I'm so glad there's no more commute. And I'm so glad that I'm an entrepreneur, entrepreneur and I never have to take the New York subway ever again in my life. No, I'm so you. happy for that. Oh my God. It's funny. You, I always say this is so corny, right? But you really do need to know your why. Like, what are you fighting for? No matter who you are in life and whether you're an entrepreneur. But my why has always been to achieve more freedom and autonomy because I am I perform better and I will do more in this world if I have more unfettered ability to pursue what's in my head. Like, and I've wanted it since I was a kid. I've wanted less subjugation, less control, you know, over me. And I wanted more mastery of my own decisions because I have a vision. And the more unfettered ability I have to implement the, the, that vision, the better off I believe the world will be, but the better off I will be. That's my why is autonomy. So it's always like, what's your mm. why? It sounds like your why is also freedom and autonomy, you know? Yes. And not 100%. A, and not a bullshit subway commute, which I get. <laughs> As we wind down, um, I want to talk to you about our 
Generation Z, because a lot of people who are older generations, they look down on Generation Z and they think that they're, you know, lazy or whatever they want to call them. But you actually think that they have great values. So talk to us about what you love about Generation Z and maybe what you think they could do differently, because I have a lot of Gen Z listeners. Oh, I love that topic. I I feel uh, really passionate about this general idea that when you're out, when you're, and I use this tacking metaphor, but I won't get into it, but I did a speech called tacking if you want to look it up, but that when you're, when you're sort of on the ground, you're in the middle of things, things look like they're getting worse, you know, or life is getting worse. But if you take a step back and you look at it from 30,000 feet, you realize the world is always getting better. And I think Gen Z is a perfect manifestation of our world getting so much better. And it's manifesting in the values of Gen Z. This generation, mm -hmm. in my view, is, rel is relatively colorblind, and I mean that in a negative way, understanding obviously, you know, all the different experiences we've had depending upon our background and making, you know, accommodations for it. But at the same time, just this, this vision of equality that pervades Gen Z is amazing. Same with sexual orientation is amazing. Mm -hmm. And so I look at my kids and the values they now espouse and their classmates, and I look at what I grew up around in Queens. And I'm like, it, it's breathtaking and makes me so happy for the future. So it's so easy to, it's really old. It's honestly, and I'm in, the, I'm 46, so I can, I can. You're not out old at all. No, I'm going to align myself is my only point. So I'm going to malign myself and anybody my age. I really think it comes from a place of insecurity of the dying of the light. Like, it's hard when you get older. You get like, it's uncomfortable. Like, what is this TikTok? And like dancing videos <laughs> and, 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 you know, and like, it, we can't relate. And so. But that's on each of us as we age to refuse to become obsolete and instead embrace or question or wonder or dip our toe into what's going on. You know, if tip TikTok makes you uncomfortable, then go open an account and see what's going on there. So I think this sort of this happens almost in every generation. Millennials used to be maligned and now Gen Z is maligned. But what is unquestionable to me is the values that Gen Z espouses. And this isn't just academic by putting that energy out into the world we're like no people get to identify however they want to identify they get to live their life however they want to live their life you know like we need to make amends for the past we cannot act like we did not commit the most tremendous atrocious crime in humanity or among them with slavery like and that has long-standing repercussions and we need to come to terms with them we are destroying our environment we're all going to hell like these are important conversations and gen z is stimulating and spurring them so i think most of the malign maligning comes from this sort of discomfort with like the world seems to be changing so fast and TikTok's so stupid <laughs> like so i don't know i find anytime i have that attitude i'm like well no no check yourself that's just you becoming obsolete you just don't like it so, mm. anyway, so anyway, i listen to my beautiful kids my my son talk about what's going on in school and and just how he views his friends and an identity and whatnot and i just think it's breathtakingly amazing so that's my view Way to leave on a high note. And the last question I ask all my guests is, what is your secret to profiting in life? What is my secret to profiting in life? I really think it's being intentional. I think that if you look at what's one of the worst emotions we go through, it's not anger, it's not sadness, it's regret. Because it's the one self-inflicted emotion that you can completely avoid. And so the antidote to regret is intention. So I think the, the secret for me profiting in life is I'm always working backwards from my deathbed and my epitaph. What do I want my epitaph to read? And what am I gonna feel on my deathbed? And if you think long and hard, you can actually project. I'm like, oh yeah, it was that. <laughs> I didn't do this. Most of it is I didn't do this, not I did this. It's kind of, cause most things when you're 80, are you really gonna care that you did this? It's mostly I didn't do this. Mm. And so the, the cure to making sure you don't have too many I didn't do this is to be really intentional. So I ask myself every single day, what is the highest and best use of Matt today? Right? It's like a concept I take from land use. We do that with a piece of property. You're always asking what's the highest and best use of this piece of land today. It evolves as the context evolves. You evolve as your context evolves. So you have to audit what's the highest and best use. I've changed. I'm not who I was yesterday. My cells are dying, but my brain is growing and my experiences are, you know, are blossoming. Who am I today? And then I set my intentions based on who am I today. And that's why when you look at my crazy life and my crazy repertoire, it's because of that pattern is constantly playing out.
Oh my gosh, I love that advice. I would recommend that you guys go rewind that right now. Wow, and where you. can, yeah, it was so good. Where can our listeners go to learn more about you and everything that you do? Well, I'm spending a lot of time on LinkedIn. That's kind of my favorite place. And I am, so Matt Higgins on LinkedIn. And I have a book coming out, uh, not for a while, uh, but we'll talk more about that. Uh, all about these topics. It's called Burn the Boats. Um, be out in about another year at HarperCollins. So awesome. find me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Cool. We'll have you back on when you have your book launch. Uh, can't wait for that. Thank you so much, Matt. This was such an, an such an awesome conversation. Oh, thanks for having me. You're amazing. Your questions are amazing. It's so thought provoking and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Young and Profiting Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please write us a review or comment on your favorite platform. Nothing makes us happier than reading your reviews. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And don't forget to share this podcast with your friends, family, and on social media. I always repost, reshare, and support those who support us. You can find me on Instagram at yapwithhala or LinkedIn. Just search for my name. It's Hala Taha. Big thanks to the Yap team as always. This is Hala signing off.